coming at it from a I'm I'm coming at it from a different perspective here. I know it was more of a the, my 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 title did not really um, is not the same as you saw in the flyer, but it still is going to be evolutionary and chemistry perspectives. So um, you know at this interface of flowers, uh, nectar, insects, and now even microbiomes, biochemistry is really critical. As I'm realizing, uh, it really is the answer to basically uh, understanding um, chemical evolution and also chemical diversity, as you all might know. Um, I um, like to show this slide because to sum it up, it has been quite the journey uh, from uh, you know the humble beginnings in the oceans to these crawling um, you know, um, bryophytes and ferns, and then eventually our uh, tracheophytes with our you know, flowering plants being the most recent uh, appearance on in the evolution of plants. Um, and flowers are really uh, fascinating as, I mean, of, of course, all of us probably know that we're plant biologists, uh, but, but you might know this, that the evolution of flowers has been, Darwin's, uh, Darwin mentioned it as an abominable mystery because of the rapid explosion of their evolution um, and diverse, diversity in those, um, in the period since which they have appeared. Um, this is a, a, a small tapestry artwork from Peru called Cuadros, and I'm actually in the process of acquiring this. I have saved up money <laughs> to get this because it is very, very dear to my heart. This is done by um, women from underprivileged uh, backgrounds in Peru, and oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. This I don't know why my notifications are not muted, um, and, and this has been uh, the, the, this work is is really cool because it's all fabric work and it's 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 huge and it really kind of makes me uh, think how beautiful flowers are. Um, so um, why um, why flowers? Why why nectar? So flowers and bees have co-evolved. Flowers and pollinators have co-evolved, of course, to not only uh, maximize pollen transfer but also to select for uh, pollinators that are very well suited for that species. Uh, which has led to that amazing chemical diversity we see in floral and floral volatiles, floral chemicals, et cetera. Um, and, and it really has been highly selected for. Um, and, and the goal is eventually to take this evolutionary adaptation, which is a pollen from one flower to another, so that um, there is maximum fitness, there is a maximum fruit set, seed set, and, and also basically this, this whole like, uh, you know, like this this whole evolution of insects, flowers, biochemical evolution, and nectar that I'm going to talk about is just so that uh, plants can basically send their to go sperms to another plant and and not you know get extinct. Uh, and so I, I like to show this to my students because at the core, all this is just driven by uh, reproductive fitness. And of course, we all know the pollen encases the sperm that then reaches the eggs, and you know, in this cutout of a flower, we see this you know, nice ovules in the ovary that are going to get fertilized by these pollen landing on them and eventually uh, creating seeds, which we uh, see um, a, a very nice uh, metamorphosis of a flower, which then becomes the fruit and loses all its floral organs. So this is just kind of a review for you. If you've, uh, if you've just needed a refresher on your floral biology, um, some of you might find this boring, but uh, essentially this is where we are at. And the reason this is so important is because this is critical to our ecosystem service. Um, you know, like fruits are eaten by not only us, but multiple animals and plants then of course benefit because as these fruits get eaten at different locations in the ecosystems, they also spread the seeds. So it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful case of plants having hacked the system to just basically spread. Um, now, of course, um, our food supply, uh, we, we do talk about our food supply a lot nowadays because with the impending population increase, uh, we, are, uh, we, we do need new ways to feed uh, all the humans that are appearing on the planet and the animals and the livestock. And 85% of, our, our, of the world's flowering plants are basically supplying uh, food for us and two thirds of the world's crop species. Uh, so basically, every uh, one bite out of three plant 
out of three food bites we take is because of pollination, because of this formation of fruits and seeds. And you can see it is a pretty uh, big problem if pollination uh, pollinators decline or if uh, accessibility or uh, to the flowers declines, or even in some cases, if flowers are bred such that their rewards are not as nutritious. So, you know, you're not, if a flower loses its ability to produce very good nectar or very good, um, um, you know, pollen, then visitations are going to decrease and that could lead to pretty uh, um, uh, loss of fitness in, uh, and loss of yield. So, so, and then of course we have this honey industry, which is good and bad because most of the pollinator work has usually been focused on honeybees, which is just the tip of the iceberg for what pollinators and flowers do. Um, and, and honey is a great product. Beeswax is a great product. We, we all love our honey, but uh, it is, it is not, it is just the beginning and the tip for what nectar does rather than just form like kind of the majority basis of honey. So the evolution of plants with, um, the evolution of plants with this kind of uh, um, 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 uh, co-evolution with insects has been fascinating on many levels. Um, we all know about pigment biochemistry when it comes to attracting insects. Uh, and how they perceive uh, light, how they perceive the pigments, because even though we might look at a flower um, such as this, uh, a Rudbeckia flower as a yellow and a black under ultraviolet light and more on a B spectrum of vision, things look very different. And so these kind of, uh, not only just the expression of these uh, pigmental genes, uh, but also their localization, tissue specific gene expression, is something that is fascinating and how uh, it has appeared in various plant families is something that we still are finding out every day, right? We, we all know that. Um, but what I focus on is nectar. So nectar is this prime, prime attractant uh, that is found in uh, mostly flowers. Now, extra floral flowers do, uh, extra floral nectaries do exist. I Barely will have time to talk about floral nectar, so I'm not even going to go there. But if you're interested, there is a great literature out there about how nectar can be produced on stems uh, and attracts ants and all that. Um, but today I'm going to talk about floral nectar. So Arabidopsis does produce nectar. You'll be surprised. Um, and I have worked with it for seven, eight years now, and it's very frustrating. Um, but um, I'm starting to move into more of a, a brassica model. Uh, which is slightly bigger. And so at the base of these flowers, right by the sepals uh, and between the uh, carpels and the stamens, you can see this nice little green structures. And let me quickly see if I can change my um, uh, pointer to a uh, laser pointer. Yep. So you can see right here, we have these green structures. Now, nectaries sometimes can be like a ring, and sometimes they can be little glandular protrusions like this. And then they, uh, as soon as anthesis happens, which is the release of pollen, they start producing nectar. And the diversity of uh, chemicals in nectar is way more complex than we used to think it was. People mostly thought that it was uh, sugars, uh, sucrose, glucose, fructose. But since then, we have discovered a plethora of compounds from, of course, proteins, peptides, amino acids, lipids, and the gamut of um, secondary metabolites or specialized metabolites is just um, insanely. And so I, I will barely be able to get into that. So nectaries themselves are protrusions or specialized um, tissue structures that can have a lot of variety. Um, this is, uh, you can sometimes have nectar being produced by bracts. Uh, sometimes you will see uh, glandular papilla-like structures. Uh, sometimes you will see very specialized structures such as this in Arabidopsis, where it's a tissue that comes right between the anthers and the sepal uh, and uh, basically has stomata. Uh, you can have lenticel-like nectar production um, and, and, and just... So I have a review in uh, from 2017 that was the last time we reviewed this. And at that point, we were still kind of uh, finding reports of various species producing nectar via various structures. But, but, but that is um, 
something that I, I like to tell because a lot of people ask me, but where is the nectar produced? And I'm like, it's a structure called a nectary. And so the question is why hide nectar at the base of flowers, right? And, and I think the, the main point here is that you want to reward the pollinator, but you also want to maximize the uh, brushing off of pollen on them. So this kind of evolution of floral structures with mouth parts of pollinators, uh, timing of pollinator visitation. So for example, you see this bat here drinking from a flower. This is a flower that produces maximum nectar at nighttime because that's when bats are active. Whereas a bee or a, a bumblebee or a butterfly will have very different uh, nectar production dynamics in those flowers. So it, as you can see, it gets really interesting. Uh, this is one of my favorite, um, you know, model a squash flower, just because you can pop a squash flower open. Uh, if you grow squashes or zucchinis, just take the male or the female flower and just pop it open and you will see a bunch of nectar just ooze out. So it really makes it fascinating. Um, and then also we have our um, um, other kinds of plants that sometimes produce nectar in cups, for example, you saw here, sometimes they'll produce it above the ovary. And then sometimes they will even produce in these glandular like depressions where uh, it's almost like, what are you selecting for? Like what kind of mouth part exists? And so we all know that famous example of, you know, Darwin's lily, which, you know, I should have had a picture here, but Darwin's lily was one of those things where it was, it had such a big spur and people were like, you know, who even comes and pollinates this? And, you know, they had predicted that there should be a insect out there with that long of a proboscis and eventually it was found. Um, so, so that kind of uh, co-evolution of mouth parts, preferences and flowers has been really fascinating. And, and, and so my work during my postdoc really dealt with this nectary. Uh, the lateral nectary and the median nectaries of Brassica and Arabidopsis. And I, and I had really gone deep into the molecular biology, genetics, and gene expression in these tissues with my postdoc advisor, Clay Carter. Um, and uh, it was fascinating because these uh, genetic circuits in here can sense uh, light, can sense, um, I have this amazing cascade of um, of hormonal interactions that lead to um, um, gene expression changes that then leads to your nectar production. So for example, this is a cutout of a nectary here. And um, you can see that here, your starch in the starch builds up at night is gradually, um, 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 is, is gradually broken down into sugars, which then are transported out by very specialized transporters called sweet nines or sweet transporters. And then eventually uh, find their way to the guard cells of the stomata, which then uh, pushes out the sugar along with water and other metabolites. Since then, we've found a lot of transporters for these metabolites exist. But uh, it gets cooler because then um, other enzymes, such as invertases, kick in and drive the breakdown of sucrose to glucose and fructose, which then keeps the osmoticum uh, such that nectar oozes out. Um, and, and it's been really cool because by genetic studies, we've been able to perturb some of these uh, invertase enzymes in our labs. So I'm sorry, my uh, citations for these two papers haven't shown up, but the top paper is from uh, Anzu Minami's paper from Clay's lab, from my lab and from, from my postdoc advisor's lab. And you can see here, if you, <laughs> excuse me, delete invertases, uh, nectar production actually stops. So you can see in this wild type here, you have this beautiful nectar droplets forming. Um, and then here in the um, in the mutants, you can see the nectar is almost dry uh, because of the loss of that inverted. Same here, uh, we see this beautiful sweet nine transporter. This is from Lynn um, and uh, uh, Lynn et al. 2016. And they discovered this transporter that is critical for sugar um, transport. Uh, in the mutants, you can see they stain very darkly for um, uh, starch, which is suggesting that in the loss of this sugar transporter, the sugar is stuck in the tissue as starch and it's not getting broken down. Um, so with that, um, you know, it kind of really leads us to how, what are the genetic circuits 
And so we have, so this is a, a study that was published by me and um, my, the uh, first author was Elizabeth Chat from Basil Nicolaus lab and Clay Carter's collaboration. And we basically um, see here that there are uh, a lot of, lot of pathways that are upregulated in different nectaries. So this is cotton nectaries. And we see that uh, in the four different kinds of nectaries cotton has, we see a bunch of uh, um, gene expression that is highly upregulated for precursor metabolites. You see a lot of uh, things that are uh, related to metal transport, metal ion transport, uh, metabolic processes that deal with starch, lipids, and also a lot of uh, um, activity that relates to um, basically your, what is it called, uh, response to stresses using chemicals, response to hormones. Uh, the nexus is just very uh, and then if you look over here, we, we also see in the secretory stages, uh, uh, there is also a lot of down regulation of uh, pathways that are involved in, um, you know, basically your oxidoreductase activities. There's a lot of like um, activity that is um, down regulated. Anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm basically rambling here because I'm starting to like look at these pathways in real time and be like, ooh, interesting hypothesis. Uh, but the bottom line is hundreds of specialized metabolites exist in nature and they are all tailored to attract pollinators, but also deter harmful organisms. Now, the reason I say harmful organisms is because these can be pathogenic bacteria and they can also be what we know as nectar robbers. Now, a nectar robber is someone who will drink the nectar, but not pollinate it. So they can puncture flowers from the side and also lead. So this kind of directed evolution is all about uh, making sure that your pollinators are happy. So there have been a lot of papers out there. If you are interested, I can always send you some more, but uh, you know, some of the ones that have made some splash are you know, when caffeine was found in a, in a flower nectar and they actually found that bees come back for more of it and actually learn from it. So they kind of get this buzz. <laughs> Um, and also nicotine uh, in, in Nicotiana has been shown to influence bumblebee learning. Uh, and so again, so there's this. And then the paper that I'm going to talk about a little bit is my postdoctoral paper of the convergent evolution of a blood red nectar uh, in a vertebrate pollinated flower. So moved away from insects a little bit. So this is um, the flower that I worked with for uh, three years. And, and actually still continue. So pigmented nectars are actually very rare. So you don't really see uh, pigmented nectars a lot. I think there are like right now reported 85 species. And these are uh, essentially, uh, now there's a pretty good reason to believe that these have been specifically uh, uh, tailored for vertebrates because clear nectar um, is mostly for insect pollinators because they don't really see the color in the nectar. They go by volatiles, they go by learning um, the reward, but vertebrates are really primed into color. That's why, uh, because if you might have seen uh, all the Nat Geo documentaries about mating rituals, they, they all have very distinctive color patterns that attract. So flowers were like, yeah, we gotta work with this man. So here we, we start seeing these very cool colored nectars in sometimes mainly in islands or very isolated spaces where the selection pressure has been pretty high. Um, and so essentially, um, come on. And so basically I worked on this flower um, and when I started on this, and the reason I have this slide here is because I was not a biochemist. I was, I call myself a noob chemist. I barely made it through Gen Chem and OCHEM. And to then uh, work on a flower that started off as just a curiosity driven project and then led to a discovery of a new pigment uh, has some is something that humbled me and also made me realize that the nature of science is actually very curiosity driven. You learn as you go. And so if you are a postdoc or a grad student or an undergrad listening right now, or even, an, even if you're a faculty, I, I would say try to get over that imposter syndrome, work with colleagues, ask stupid questions and just be curious. And next thing you know, you've, you've started working with a great team that discovers something. So, so this uh, nectar is found on this island of Mauritius, only on the island of Mauritius. And it is found actually in only some cliffs, it's not even in like 
you know, flatlands. And so it has been propagated a lot in um, uh, greenhouses. So that's how we got access to it at a University of Minnesota greenhouse. And what we found was, so the nectar was not always red. So we, we as my undergraduate, Catherine Hall was looking at these uh, flowers in the morning, she would come back and say, hey, it's looking yellow, which kind of then turned red within a couple of hours and then got really blood red within 24 hours and copious amounts of nectar. So this led us to just kind of ask very simple questions of, you know, is it a pH-based change? Is it, what are the chemicals in the nectar? And that kind of started this project on the side where we gradually discovered that the pH of the yellow nectar is more on like acidic 6.5 range and then gradually it alkalinizes. Um, can I quickly ask how am I doing on time? You're doing fine. I think uh, keep going, you know, if, if you go for another 10 or 15 minutes, that's okay. There will still be time for some questions, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, so basically, once this pH-based change was observed, we then started asking, what are, the, what are the absorbance patterns of these nectar? And we started finding these cool little uh, things where we found that mostly in the yellow nectar and the intermediate nectar, um, the absorbances around 350 were confirmed to be coming from a molecule uh, called sinapaldehyde. And then in between, uh, at you know, in between um, that time and the 24-hour rise in the uh, pigmentation intensity and the change of color, we found that uh, sinapaldehyde was still present. But there was this peak that at that time we could not recognize in the mass spec, um, and and it did not exist in the chemical library, which kind of also confused us because in 19 99, I think, this species was reported to have an orone as its uh, nectar pigment. And, and that paper, I think, had come out in Nature. And so we were kind of really confused because uh, that structure would not exist in an alkaline environment, or at least wouldn't explain this. And the mass spec peak was really not matching up to that. So the only way we could explain that is if we took sinapaldehyde's molecular weight and added it to one of the most prolifically found amino acids in nectar called proline. And so if you add that up, it kind of really matched up to that peak. And that kind of led to this structural discovery of a new proline sinapaldehyde conjugate called nesocodin. And so nesocodin is what really gives this red pigment. But what is cool is it is not present in the yellow nectar. And so as we added, and so we were able to recapitulate this experiment by taking sinapaldehyde and proline and gradually changing the pH and making it alkaline. And we were actually able to make uh, nesocodin in uh, Eppendorf tubes. It was really cool seeing the change in color. Now, um, the University of Minnesota immediately patented this because it was a novel pigment. But what gets really interesting is that we were like, what creates it in the nectar? So when we ran a protein gel, uh, we found that over time, as the nectar got more and more red, there were these distinctive bands that started appearing. And when we did our peptide mass spec, we found that these were three enzymes that are in the families of an alcohol ox oxidase, a ferritin-like catalase, and a carbonic anhydrase, which we were able to confirm by multiple ways. For example, here we were able to confirm in gel, carbonic anhydrase assay, and all that. And so at the end, we basically were able to figure out that these enzymes in sequential steps were basically converting sinapyl alcohol in the pre-nectar exudate to sinapaldehyde in the presence of NEC3, which is your alcohol oxidase right here. And then that, in the presence of proline, would produce red color. And that basically is what was happening. Now, if, I mean, in, in to respect your time, uh, we eventually were able to find out that the catalase was destroying the hydrogen peroxide that was being produced because hydrogen peroxide is produces reactive species. Um, and then also we were able to find out that the carbonic anhydrase was changing the pH 
to make it more alkaline. So this was a the, this was a very cool collaboration between chemists and biologists in the department. But what really made this really cool and kind of blew my mind an accidental conversation in a bus with a colleague who I'd never met before led to me asking, "Hey, we have this red nectar. I think geckos pollinated. So the presumed pollinator of this flower was a gecko in Mauritius, but of course nobody had seen it." So I was telling him about this and he said, you know what, I look at gecko and butterfly retinal modeling and how about you make the pigment and we'll send it. So he did some reflectance modeling. So to kind of break down this graph, if you just look at these kind of dots here, it's kind of showing you in the visual space of a gecko. If the background rock is right here, it's not very conspicuous and the petals are right here. The Nesocodon Mauritianus nectar really pops out. And at the same time, it is very conspicuous. And when um, Dr. Chiari from George Mason actually did these studies with geckos, they consistently went for the red nectar Nesocodon sitting in sugar water. So this visual uh, confirmation was amazing. And then our convergent evolution story got really interesting because we found a distantly related flower called Faltomara that is naturally found in the hills of Peru, pretty far from the Indian Ocean. And it was the same pigment and it was the same chemistry and it was the same enzymes. So this is why uh, this has been such an interesting project because it's been at the crossroads of so many disciplines. Uh, since then, uh, uh, Clay, Clay's lab. Um, I started this project recently. A graduate student just published it in Neophytologist. We also worked with a black nectar from a, a, a species called Melianthus minor. And as you can see, when the nectar begins off, it's more milky white, but it gets really, really black with very dark absorbance. So it absorbs all the light. And we Again, through our similar pipeline, we we're able to figure out that it had very high amounts of elagic acid and gallic acid. And when this was coupled with iron, uh, so we did it with both ferrous sulfate and ferric chloride, we found that that elagic acid with iron coupled made a huge, huge uh, uh, jump in absorbance and created the color black. So it seems like uh, nectaries and plants are really using the chemistry available, to, or not using them, they're not anthropogenic, but, but basically there's, there's a selection for uh, these reactions to create these intense pigments that then attract um, uh, vertebrates. So in this case, Melianthus is attracted by, uh, um, Melianthus attracts birds. So birds are seeing something that is drawing them to this and in the paper, we've also done the same visual modeling with our collaborators to show that the black on red uh, right here is actually very conspicuous to flowers flying. And it kind of blows my mind because you see how small these flowers are, but clearly this, this contrast from the top as they fly through uh, is, is just uh, enough to get them. And I'm going to end with just a little uh, thing about nectars and microbiome. So uh, a lot of this work is, uh, I've not done a lot of work on this, but it's, it's, I wrote a review on antimicrobials in nectar and kind of really got me thinking that a lot of these chemicals that are being produced in nectar are also having an intense effect on not only pollinator um, health and attraction, but also on the microbes. So this is a great milieu for microbial interactions. So nectar does have a pretty intense microbiome. It is species poor, but nutrient rich, which makes it very interesting. And there are generalists, which are basically microbes that hang around, but then there are also specialists that sometimes appear. So I, I wish I could talk about this more, but just a quick stuff. So from these diluted nectars, from these colored pigments, I'm finding very unique species. Uh, that are growing. And some of these species I have gone ahead and sequenced. And, and of course, you know, these are growing in Minnesota. So I'm, I'm looking at, and actually the Melianthus is from California. But what I'm seeing is, you know, these interesting like things are coming up. So for example, I recently found a bacteria uh, in this black nectar that glows. And so clearly it is producing something, maybe uh, a siderophore or something that is maybe adding a different level of complexity to this nectars. 
And then also an end with uh, the peptide world. So if you're a peptide chemist, protein biochemist, there are also something for you here. Um, there are these very distinctive high amounts of very small lipid uh, binding proteins called LTPs that we found in Brassica Rapa, not we, uh, Clay, Clay's lab. So this is all stuff I was either um, seeing or uh, like seeing on the happening on the side benches or kind of directly involved with. And this was really crazy because these have been um, supposedly uh, been hypothesized to be antimicrobial or antifungal. And we do see that when we add that uh, peptide to the fungal cultures, some of them that are pathogenic, they really inhibit their growth. So that kind of adds to that nectar biochemicals and peptides being uh, selected for that are giving the nectar protection. So this is my call to action to the community. If you're a, if you're a geneticist, if you're a molecular biologist, there is a lot of studies to be done. This is a figure that me and um, a couple of colleagues published as a letter in um, uh, American Journal of Botany, and and but then also as chemists, you know, there is a lot of diversity from metabolites to um, amino acid diversity, sugar composition, and how it relates to pollinator health. And finally, uh, also, uh, if you're a uh, if you're just a straight up microscopist, cell biologist, you know, there is a lot of questions of how nectaries form, how are they connected vascularly to the phloem, and then also how are things trafficked in there. So with that, I just wanted to end. There are way too many colleagues and collaborators to show in an acknowledgement slide, but this picture is from yesterday, actually. So Clay and his lab members came over to my university for a poster presentation of my three undergrads here. And then uh, also a collaborator, Kim Ha, who is uh, working on the lipid transfer proteins. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry if this was just too much and too scattered, but I also just really wanted to uh, give you um, an overview of uh, where nectar chemistry stands. Um, so yeah. And I will take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Raul. Yeah. Great, great presentation. Yeah. yeah, any questions for, for our whole? I suppose, yeah, I could I can ask a, a question. Uh, just on the <clears throat> on the part of the uh, nectaries where you were exploring kind of the mechanism that it comes out with, uh, and you mentioned the action of invertase. Mm -hmm. um, so this, it's a change, uh, what allows it to kind of secrete out, or at least passively, is the change in osmotic pressure. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're just doubling the concentration. Yep. And so, but you're, all right, so at what point does that happen that it kind of like, so you kind of excrete a little bit out or something and then hydrolyze and then all the water leaves the cell? Is that what's yes, happening? absolutely, absolutely. So it's an inverted that is bound to the cell wall. That's, so, Okay. So it's a cell wall invertis, and as the sucrose is exiting, and we, 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 you know, the hypothesis is that it's localized right at the cell walls of the stomata and all. It leaves it to produce glucose and fructose, and of course, you know, the, some of the sucrose persists, but yeah, then that drives the water uh, out to form the nectar droplet. Now it gets interesting because, uh, you know, uh, Michael, if you uh, think about it, there are nectars that are sucrose rich straight up there's very less fructose and glucose. And those, those species actually don't have a lot of cell wall inverters expression. So, so again, a great question to ask, how does that nectar? I was asking that, yeah, specifically, because I was working with cassava and I mean, okay. it had extra floral nectary. So on the leaves, it would just have like random deposits of tons mm -hmm. of sugar just sitting on it uh, at one point. And I, I, I looked at like, oh, what's the chemistry of this thing? And it's just sucrose. It's just straight it's up just it's sucrose, 100 percent yeah. sucrose in there. So, yeah, I was wondering how I mean, I guess that's more active, maybe just straight active transporter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really cool mechanism. That's a really awesome, awesome mechanism. Yeah. 
I had a question related to that, I guess. Um, so if it's okay, I'll jump in. The, is that transport of the sucrose in the first place, is that active? Is that driven by like a, a powered transporter? Yes, it is a sweet nine transporter. So I you see. know the sweet transporters, the yeah. it's called sugars will eventually be transported transporter. <laughs> so so yeah, so that was a that was a study from uh, basically uh, I think um, uh, uh, it was be definitely before I joined uh, the lab uh, and and it was uh, I'm trying to think if it oh, oh my gosh I'm blanking out on the name I do wanna I do wanna say it because now that I've started it um, the famous lab can't believe I'm blanking out. Um, okay. The, my, um, Wolf, Wolf Fromer's lab. Wolf okay. Fromer and Clay did this, uh, and they figured out this very specific suite that was localized in the uh, nectaries. And if you if you, if you um, edit, uh, if you basically mutate it, or if you work with Arabidopsis mutants that don't have it, the nectar doesn't have it. I'm actually going to paste the paper right here so that if somebody's okay. in I guess my so, well, that sounds good. Thank you. And my, my question about it is I've always been amazed with um with nectar and how it can be it can be like a very concentrated pool of metabolites and specialized metabolites. And I'm always interested in how those kinds of pools arise because it's like you're creating a big concentration gradient in some senses. And these can be difficult to create. And so I'm wondering if you know anything about does the invertase once it cleaves the sucrose, does this help relieve some of the difficulty with creating a big concentration of concentration gradient of sucrose? Because now the like essentially the sink is 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 deeper or different in some ways. So you're not pumping further yet more sucrose into a sucrose rich environment. It's yeah. now sucrose poor, perhaps because it's all being cleaved. Is that a thing, or am I just imagining? So, uh, if I if I if I want to repeat your question, are you asking why is some nectar sucrose poor? I guess my question is, does does having the invertase make exporting sucrose easier? Absolutely, I think so because it drives. So so this is again full disclosure. This is Anzu Minami's work, another postdoc in Clay's lab, who's done majority of this work. And in that, they found that when the invert is, so, so the, the brassica does make sucrose fructose mixed uh, nectar, but when the invert is, is knocked out, it prevents the nectar from coming out. <clears throat> it's not like suddenly the nectar is sucrose rich. It prevents the exudation of nectar, which suggests that invert is, even if it is not like 100%, you know, uh, penetrant towards sucrose, I guess I don't think the word penetrance can be used there. It's not genetic, but but you know, like you you get it, right? If, if if all of the sucrose is not being degraded, it still needs the inverters to somehow pump it out, and um and yeah, so so yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna quickly also answer um uh, yep. Elizabeth's yes. question. So Elizabeth, this is this is great because if you read the article called uh um uh, uh, I'm I'm gonna hold on. I, I have to share this with you. Um, horizons of nectar. We actually have this uh, discussion in that is what is a nectary, right? Because it's it's like, is it a gland? Is it a patch of trichomes? Is it uh, a little, uh, you know, lenticel, as you said? So the thing is, it's not because it has to be an organized tissue. So it can't be a hydrothode, right? Um, and and it, it has to be uh, basically a, a little bit of a tissue. So I just pasted the link. Um, it has to be a little bit of tissue that has a close function and has gene expression patterns that change to prepare for exudation of sugars uh, to attract. Um, um, but but yeah, it, it's a great question. We have trichomes, papilla. Uh, we, we even have nectaries where the cells rupture and the, from the cuticle, uh, the nectar oozes out, right? So So it's like, do we need a transporter? Do we just burst open a cell? I mean, and 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 that's why... Uh, yeah, that's why it, it's, it's a great question. So, yeah. Ah, Monica's question is something I'm not even going to tackle because I'm not an evolutionary and developmental biologist, but we, but I'm going to answer it, of course, right? So, or at least try and answer it. I think, I think, yes. Um, I think the problem is if I'm correct, and Monica, I'm assuming you know something about hydrothodes. Hydrothodes usually are at the tips of leaves to relieve pressure, right? Hydrostatic pressure. 
But nectaries, especially the one in the flowers, it's a bit weird because the vasculature, if you see, doesn't connect into the nectary, right? The vasculature doesn't innervate the nectary. It doesn't like, the, the, the vasculature doesn't end up. And so, yes, it could be a hydrothode that has been highly specialized over time, but I am not, I'm not sure how they formed. It would really need a nice Evo Devo uh, perspective research, see various species and see their vasculature and their, yeah, yeah, great questions. I'm, I'm just very, I, I, I really, I really encourage all of you to grab just one nectar around you and and do anything with it that you can because it really is it, it's a frontier that i i feel like we all we were so focused on figuring out floral genetics and you know leaf and everything that somehow in between uh, we kind of just feel like oh it's just sugar water <laughs> it's not it's like the gatorade of nature um, plus i think it's also a little bit of like drugs mixed in it for you know the insects who want to <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me here. I, I really appreciate um, being able to talk. I think, Mon I think Monica has one more question. She just of raised course. her hand. Yes. Yeah, Monica, go ahead. Yes, it was actually um, like um, following up um, to what you just said about nectar is not being directly connected to the phloem. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you see? a uh, kind of a correlation between the phloem content and the nectar content because this is what we actually are not really observing yet at a hundred percent but kind of going that direction thank yeah. you so, so monica are you did you just say that you are not seeing it like in the sense i use uh studying um uh, phloem exudates and nectar too uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, you said the nectaries are not really connected to yeah. the phloem. Yes, I understand. But I, from my perspective, there there's a kind of a connection between whatever is moved from leaves. And I fully agree with you. Is definitely filtered by uh, by the flower uh, yeah. because yeah. then in nectar in nectar we find different a uh, whole different set of metabolites. Yeah. But I'm wondering if although they are not 100% connected mm -hmm. uh, to the phloem, there must be, in my opinion, a, a kind of connection. And this is what makes me thinking the nectar is, may represent um, an, an evolutionary path from idotodes. Absolutely. Monica, I, I absolutely hear you. I think that is... And I think the only way to test that would be to see, um, uh, you know, like uh, relatives, um, you know, on the, you know, like close, close relatives, ancestral uh, or distantly related and see the different kinds of nectaries. Um, and I think some of the work is being done by uh, some of the, but, but Monica, I think my biggest uh, confusion in that whole process is why, if the nectary had to produce a primarily sugar rich um, exudate with metabolites that the plant can produce in its leaves, <clears throat> why not just connect the phloem right up, up till the tip and then put some kind of a control mechanism? Like it ends pretty early on. And then there is a bunch of cells connected by plasma desmata. So for example, the starch buildup, like there are uh, there are, uh, you know, the sugar transporters bring in the sugar and then the sucrose phosphate synthesis uh, convert it into starch and store it in the nectary. And then in the morning, if you if you do like a stain and also like a RNA seq of the tissue, you see all those, you know, beta amylase genes, starch degradation genes get upregulated. All the metabolite transporter genes, for example, some of the uh, metal, some a lot of metals are secreted into nectar, they get activated. So my thing is like, why have that extra step of first packaging? So I think of it as like a, you know, like a kitchen prep, like they're almost like, you know, getting everything pre-prepped, vegetables are chopped, and then in the morning they're cooking it. So my thing is why not just deliver the food in the morning? So, so, so hydrothodes are more like that. They do like a hydrostatic pressure. So I think the coolest thing will be to find something that is transient between a hydrothode and something that has a tissue. And I, I don't even know how to approach that question, but if, if somebody can, I think that'll be a big, big, big uh, jump in our understanding of where did nectaries come from. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and it's okay. sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying thank you. I agree. We actually need something in between to 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 be able to demonstrate if they or not come from idotodes. Yeah, yeah, it's and yeah, and then I think there actually a better system might be to study the extra floral nectars. So if you just search extra, I mean, or Monica, you might know this, but if you don't know what an extra floral nectar is, just search it online. And it's just like these little discs on stems. Acacia trees have it. Um, and, and it's just like, it's like a cup, right, on the stem and ants come and drink it. And so that is, I would see more like a, you know, a lenticel, hydrothod model. Flowers, I, I'm not sure, really. It's just so much variation in nectary sizes, nectary locations, nectary tissue, nectary secretion types. Like, you know, there's ecrine models, uh, merocrine models. So like basically they use either transporters or they completely uh, dissociate to release the nectar. Or sometimes they just actively, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, accrue it, but then throw it out by secretory vesicles. So it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a very active, area for a lot of unanswered questions, I feel like. <clears throat> there is one more question here in the chat. Um, it says, oh, yeah. yeah, it says, do nectars just have a role in pollination or might yep. there be other roles due to the presence of such a plethora of compounds rather than just sugars? Yeah, so Chaitanya, a great question. I think the main thing to remember here is that the pollinators, yes, if you've of course selected mainly to attract pollinators uh, so that you can, you know, like transfer pollen. But I think because microbiomes are becoming so big now and there might be, very, we're finding very specialized microbes in the nectar. I think it's also going to be very interesting to see if this has been also a strategy for them to protect the flower from getting attacked by a pathogen, right? Because if the chemical environment of the nectar is selecting for microbes that are um, antagonistic to pathogens, you are going to also have that level of microbial evolution going on. So as I said, you know, like, I mean, you can see, right? Why I'm like, I'm asking all of you to work on nectar. It's like, it's like you, talk, you, you pass through and you ask a question and you're like, oh, that's a paper. That's a project. <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, Chaitanya, it's primarily primarily um, pollinators, I would say, at now. Um, and then and then of course the extra floral nectars are more for protection. So the ants don't really pollinate the, the plant because you know it's on the stems. But because they know that at certain you know uh, you know kind of like checkpoints there will be nectar, they constantly are patrolling. And if they see an aphid or or something that is attacking the tree, they they attack it and kill it. So, so then that is a different kind of evolution for protection, herbivory protection. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, yeah. I think we're uh, right up to the hour here, but this was an extremely interesting talk. Thank you very much, Rahul, and thank you yeah. everyone for a lively Q and A session. Yeah, uh, I think I'll never think about nectar the same way again, or about <laughs> pollinators getting getting drugged by by nectar. I, yeah, very nice. Thank you very much. And, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, and that was the goal, you know, just to kind of spark that. Yeah, and and we, I physically, you know, I physically cannot study all of them, or me, you know, like me and Clay always talk about this. Like we cannot physically keep up. We have so many frozen nectars in our freezers, you know, like it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, please, if you, if you have questions, if you want to discuss, if you want to collaborate, you know, I'm at a smaller institution. So my research capabilities are not like, you know, like a lab full of postdocs and graduate students, but my undergraduates uh, are, are working on small projects. I collaborate with people. So I'm always happy to, you know, finish stories in that environment. So please don't hesitate. And um, even for a chat. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, we'll right. be in touch, everyone. We'll see you in, a, in, in I think, three weeks for, for another talk. Have a good weekend. Right. Thank yeah. you.